Hello there everyone, welcome to the channel if you're new, welcome back if you aren't, I am EDJ and we're going to be continuing with Extra Histories Otto von Bismarck. So last time we learned about his youth, you know, of a very, yeah, operatively worded wild man <laughs> and, you know, basically about his, I guess, step into politics now. And he doesn't seem to be cool with democracy and, and all these other ideas, you know. So it's going to be interesting to see how his idea, if his political views evolve, which I imagine they kind of would. Like, I, does anyone truly stay the same from like their entire lives? Actually, no, I think about it. Yes, a lot of people do. <laughs> At least here in America, once you're in a certain party, some people are very. Never change. Never mind. Point is, I I'm looking forward to seeing how he evolves and what great ideas he comes up with. So yes, if you want to watch the original video, link is down below. Without any further ado, let's learn about a man of great ideas, Otto von Bismarck by Extra History TV. No, Extra History TV. <laughs> I was thinking of Epic History. It's Extra. Extra, Epic, same difference. Let's just get to it. <laughs> 1848, the People's Spring, springtime of nations, the year of revolution. Oh dear. Bismarck's political life ended nearly as abruptly as it started. For as the summer of 1847 began, the king, unable to get a railroad grant from the Diet without also granting a constitution, threw his hands up in the air, dissolved the Diet, and sent everybody packing. Bismarck went back home to his estate, finally completed that whole business of getting married, and went on his honeymoon. But as he traveled Europe, and when he returned home, he noticed a strange tension in the air, an unrest in the streets, in the cities. Then, in February 1848, Paris erupted. The monarchy fell. A republic was re-established in France. Bismarck was concerned. At home and abroad, he had seen the strain between the working class and those who ruled, but he never expected something so abrupt or so successful to happen in France. Then Vienna fell. Metternich, the great Austrian statesman and architect of the Concert of Europe, was displaced. This opened up an opportunity. Yeah, as we learned about, um, through e epic histories telling of the... 1848 revolutions. Yeah, Metternich, for a guy very much praised and obviously having a role to play in the Napoleonic, you know, era, kind of met this really anticlimactic end. He got kicked out and essentially just kind of died in exile. So, yeah, it was a little anticlimactic, his, his end. As the Austrians had long been the dominant force among German states, but it also served as a warning. It was clear that revolution was coming to Prussia soon. But Bismarck worried that the king was too weak and too vacillating to put down a revolution. And he was right. As word of the revolution in Vienna spread, Prussians took to the streets, and soon the king promised them a constitutional government. But as the people were celebrating their victory in Berlin, the celebration turned into a clash. Shots were fired. Government troops killed revolutionaries. Many, including Bismarck, believed that now there was no choice but to crush the revolution. The king, though, disagreed, and ordered the troops out of Berlin, effectively leaving himself hostage to the revolution. And then came the first of Bismarck's good-ish ideas. Mm -hmm. He raced back to his estate and organized an old-school peasant levy. Yes, in the middle of the 19th century, he tried to press his peasants into service as their feudal lord in order to put down a revolution whose stated goals were to enfranchise and empower those same peasants. <laughs> With this great idea in mind, he handed them all shotguns and said, Come on, lads, to Berlin. But just as they were storming off, one of his spoil sport neighbors came out and told him to stop hurling a firebrand into the country, threatening to talk the peasants out of this nonsense. Bismarck politely replied, You know that I am a quiet man, but if you do that, I shall shoot you. So with revolt- Holy crap. <laughs> oh, that's wild. This is already wild. Holy crap, what the, what the heck am I listening to? So he like, Alright, I'm gonna use peasants to stop them from getting their rights. Genius. But, no. 
<laughs> he's weaponizing his. Oh my goodness, that's insane. I, I, how the heck is this gonna go? Is he seriously about to go and just fight people? <laughs> Revolver in hand and four, yes, four bullets in his pocket. He led his feudal levy to go liberate the king. <laughs> Unfortunately, when he got to the first army camp, which was staffed by many of the conservative officers that he had come to mingle with after making his fiery speeches in Berlin, he was promptly told, Yes, we are all a bit disappointed right now, but no, we really don't want your peasant mob messing this up even more, so how about you go send your peasants back and bring us some corn and potatoes or something? Not content to serve as mere fodder provider for the army, Otto then had his second good-ish idea. He left his estate and tried to sneak into Berlin again, with the cleverest of ruses, trimming his beard. Needless to say, many people saw through his incredible mind games, and soon he was laughed out of Berlin. But Bismarck was not done. He had a third good-ish idea. With the king making ever greater concessions to the revolutionaries, Bismarck saw it as his place to help elevate one of the king's relatives to the throne. So Bismarck went all in on trying to replace King Frederick Wilhelm with a confusingly but more succinctly named King Wilhelm. But Wilhelm had legged it to England, and he wasn't going to listen to this wild man anyway. So Bismarck began to hunt for a new candidate. Soon he found another royal relative named Charles, who proposed that his even more confusingly named son, Frederick Wilhelm, <laughs> should replace Frederick Wilhelm on the throne. Oh my god. Yo, Wil Wilhelm must have been a very popular name. <laughs> There's been like 10 Wil Wilhelm so far. <laughs> oh man. I love... I love... This man's insane ideas. First, he was—he basically made his own little militia, <laughs> and now he's going. Now he's trying to like sneak into Berlin, and now he's just trying to usurp the key. Like, what the heck? <laughs> this Frederick Wilhelm, or Fritz—I'm gonna call him Fritz—was six years old. But nobody had asked Fritz's mom. I mean, they eventually did, but more as an afterthought, with Bismarck awkwardly meeting her in her servant's quarters. Not asking turned out to be a mistake, though, because Fritz's mom supported the liberals and put the kibosh on the whole thing. Mm. It would seem that Bismarck had made an enemy of the mother of this six-year-old he hoped to put on the throne. Oh my Nonetheless, he was soon summoned for the second Prussian Diet, which the king had ordered a symbol to hammer out how to make a real parliament for Prussia. There, Bismarck spoke passionately about the noble past that they were so casually throwing away, even becoming choked with emotion and having to stop mid-speech, but to no avail. The Diet did its job and created the Prussian National Assembly, which Bismarck was very not elected to. This Prussian National Assembly pushed for a real parliamentary system along British lines, though, and soon the king began to lose patience with the body. So Bismarck joined the Camarilla, which was not, in fact, a secret society of vampires which has kept their presence hidden from humanity for hundreds of years, <laughs> though I can understand your confusion, and let's be honest, Bismarck would have made a great vampire, but no. Bismarck <laughs> joined the much more boring but real group of nobles and courtiers close to the king who were determined to maintain the power of the monarchy through non-vampiric means. And let's go ahead and call this one Bismarck's first actual good idea. I need to find the best way to learn math and science. <sighs> it's brilliant.org. Because this put him in contact with many powerful men. But even though, by all accounts, he was an effective member of the society, and even though he had amplified the conservative voice in Prussian politics by establishing a newspaper, when the liberal cause fell apart and the conservatives once again became ascendant, he was passed over for a cabinet position. They were very happy to use him when a radical was needed, but once the time came to re-establish order, the wild man was cast aside. So Bismarck returned to his estate to witness the birth of his first child. But Bismarck had a plan. Bismarck always had a plan. You see, even though the liberals had failed to get anything like the constitution they had wanted, they had gotten a constitution, and with it, a parliament, the Landtag. And Bismarck, always a pragmatist under whatever colors he may have worn, decided to get himself elected to this new body. The fight was fierce. He knew that he wouldn't get elected in his own region, so he decided to run for office in the city of Brandenburg. But there he was an outsider, running against the local mayor. He acted with vigor, describing his campaign headquarters as a military camp, with messengers running in and out at all hours, and strategy being formulated so that he never missed an opportunity to speak to the few hundred men who would eventually determine the representative for Brandenburg. 
He won by 25 votes. Wow. Now he was once again at the center of things. And the question at hand on everybody's mind was the unification of Germany. If the 39 German states that had survived the Napoleonic invasion banded together, they could change the face of European politics forever. But how to achieve that was a matter of some debate. They could either come together under Austria or under Prussia. But Austria rejected the possibility of unification, because the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Habsburg-inherited lands included far more territory than just the German portions. And the whole point of unification was German nationalism. Germans would never accept rule by a sovereign who was also ruling over other nations. This meant that the Austrians would either have to divide their empire and give some other branch of the family their German territories, or simply reject unification outright. And they chose the latter. The German National Assembly, which was different from the Landtag in that it represented all German states, decided, with little other choice, to offer the imperial crown to Frederick Wilhelm. Nobles in the Landtag, including Bismarck, urged him to accept. But the king rejected the proposal, and this allowed Bismarck the opportunity to rail against the constitution that would have come with it. He was blasted by the press, and sure of losing his seat in the next election. But when the king dissolved the Landtag, he changed the election rules for the next session in ways that favored landowners like Bismarck, which ensured his re-election. After giving some blistering speeches on the role of the monarchy, and some strong invectives against even the monarch's own move toward a constitutional unification, Bismarck got himself moved to the new assembly debating the question of unification. But before that could go anywhere, he got caught up in the next great conflict. The war over territory seemed to loom between Austria and Prussia, and it is here that we see the evolution of Bismarck. Because though in many ways he was, and always would be, a man of war, when a settlement was offered, and many pushed to reject it and go to war instead, Bismarck rose and said, It is unworthy of a great state to fight for something which does not concern its own interest. Gentlemen, show me an objective worthy of war, and I will go along with you. It is easy enough for a statesman to ride the popular wave from the comfort of his own fireside, making thunderous speeches from the rostrum, letting the public sound the trumpets of war, and leaving it to the musketeer, bleeding out his life's blood in the snowy wastes to mm. settle whether policies end in glory or in failure. Nothing is simpler. But woe to any statesman who, at such a time, fails to find a cause of war which will stand up to scrutiny once the fighting is over. And so begins wow. the transformation of Bismarck the Radical to Bismarck, man of royal politique. Hmm. That was very interesting. Yeah, you're just... This video was basically the, you know, the further uh, evolution of his political career. And, yeah, you seemed like he had to really work super hard to, you know make it and he definitely stepped on a on a on toes <laughs> to put it nicely but it all worked out and yeah i guess we're gonna be seeing a bit more about the german unification because that's something he's very famous for having a hand to play or being the mastermind of that so i'm really looking forward it seems like it could be in the next part so Yes. <laughs> I will be jumping forward to the next part as of right now. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye, everyone.